part three chapter two of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a raw youth by fyodor dostoyevsky translated by constance garnet part three chapter two one i had not forgotten liza mother was mistaken the keen-sighted mother saw that there was something like coolness between brother and sister but it was rather jealousy than lack of love in view of what followed i will explain in a couple of words ever since prince sergey's arrest poor liza had shown a sort of conceited pride an unapproachable haughtiness almost unendurable but every one in the house knew the truth and understood how she was suffering and if at first i scowled and was sulky at her manner with us it was simply owing to my petty irritability increased tenfold by illness that is how i explain it now i had not ceased to love liza on the contrary i loved her more than ever only i did not want to be the first to make advances though i understood that nothing would have induced her either to make the first advances as soon as all the facts came out about prince sergey that is immediately after his arrest liza made haste at once to take up an attitude to us and to every one else that would not admit of the possibility of sympathy or any sort of consolation and excuses for prince sergey on the contrary she seemed continually priding herself on her luckless lover's action as though it were the loftiest heroism though she tried to avoid all discussion of the subject she seemed every moment to be telling us all though i repeat that she did not utter a word none of you would do the same you would not give yourself up at the dictates of honour and duty none of you have such a pure and delicate conscience and as for his misdeeds who has not evil actions upon his conscience only every one conceals them and this man preferred facing ruin to remaining ignoble in his own eyes this seemed to be expressed by every gesture liza made i don't know but i think in her place i should have behaved almost in the same way i don't know either whether those were the thoughts in her heart in fact i privately suspect that they were not with the other clear part of her reason she must have seen through the insignificance of her hero for who will not agree now that that unhappy man noble-hearted in his own way as he was was at the same time an absolutely insignificant person this very haughtiness and as it were antagonism towards us all this constant suspiciousness that we were thinking differently of him made one surmise that in the secret recesses of her heart a very different judgment of her unhappy friend had perhaps been formed but i hasten to add however that in my eyes she was at least half right it was more pardonable for her than for any of us to hesitate in drawing the final conclusion i will admit with my whole heart that even now when all is over i don't know at all how to judge the unhappy man who was such a problem to us all home was beginning to be almost a little hell on account of her liza whose love was so intense was bound to suffer terribly it was characteristic of her to prefer to suffer in silence her character was like mine proud and domineering and i thought then and i think now that it was that that made her love prince sergey just because he had no will at all and that from the first word from the first hour he was utterly in subjection to her this comes about of itself in the heart without any preliminary calculation but such a love the love of the strong woman for the weak man is sometimes incomparably more intense and more agonizing than the love of equal characters because the stronger unconsciously undertakes responsibility for the weaker 
that is what i think at any rate all the family from the first surrounded her with the tenderest care especially mother but liza was not softened she did not respond to sympathy and seemed to repulse every sort of help at first she did talk to mother but every day she became more reluctant to speak more abrupt and even more harsh she asked versilov's advice at first but soon afterwards she chose vassin for her counsellor and helper as i learned afterwards with surprise she went to see vassin every day she went to the law courts too by prince sergey's instructions she went to the lawyers to the crown prosecutor she came in the end to being absent from home for whole days together twice a day of course she visited prince sergey who was in prison in the division for noblemen but these interviews as i was fully convinced later were very distressing to liza of course no third person can judge of the relations of two lovers but i know that prince sergey was always wounding her deeply and by what do you suppose strange to say by his continual jealousy of that however i will speak later but i will add one thought on the subject it would be hard to decide which of them tormented the other more though with us she prided herself on her hero liza perhaps behaved quite differently alone with him i suspect so indeed from various facts of which however i will also speak later and so as regards my feeling and my attitude towards liza any external change there was was only simulated a jealous deception on both sides but we had never loved each other more than at that time i must add too that though liza showed surprise and interest when makar ivanovitch first arrived she had since for some reason begun to treat him almost disdainfully even contemptuously she seemed intentionally to take not the slightest notice of him having inwardly vowed to be silent as i explained in the previous chapter i expected of course theoretically that is in my dreams to keep my word oh with versilov for instance i would have sooner begun talking of zoology or of the roman emperors than of her for example or of that most important line in his letter to her in which he informed her that the document was not burnt but in existence a line on which i began pondering to myself again as soon as i had begun to recover and come to my senses after my fever but alas from the first steps towards practice and almost before the first steps i realized how difficult and impossible it was to stick to such resolutions the day after my first acquaintance with makar ivanovitch i was fearfully excited by an unexpected circumstance two i was excited by an unexpected visit from daria anisimovna the mother of the dead girl olia from my mother i had heard that she had come once or twice during my illness and that she was very much concerned about my condition whether that good woman as my mother always called her when she spoke of her had come entirely on my account or whether she had come to visit my mother in accordance with an established custom i did not ask mother usually told me all the news of the household to entertain me when she came with my soup to feed me before i could feed myself i always tried to appear uninterested in these domestic details and so i did not ask about daria anisimovna in fact i said nothing about her at all it was about eleven o'clock i was just meaning to get out of bed and install myself in the armchair by the table when she came in i purposely remained in bed mother was very busy upstairs and did not come down so that we were left alone she sat down on a chair by the wall facing me smiled and said not a word i foresaw this pause and her entrance altogether made an irritating impression on me 
without even nodding to her i looked her straight in the face but she too looked straight at me are you dull in your flat now the prince is gone i asked suddenly losing patience no i am not in that flat now through anna andreyevna i am looking after his honour's baby now whose baby andrey petrovitch's she brought out in a confidential whisper glancing round towards the door why but there's tatiana pavlovna yes tatiana pavlovna and anna andreyevna both of them and lizaveta makarovna also and your mamma all of them they all take an interest tatiana pavlovna and anna andreyevna are great friends now a piece of news she grew much livelier as she talked i looked at her with hatred you are much livelier than when you came to see me last oh yes i think you've grown stouter she looked strangely at me i have grown very fond of her very fond of whom why anna andreyevna very fond such a noble young lady and with such judgment you don't say so what about her how are things now she is very quiet very she was always quiet always if you've come here with scandal i cried suddenly unable to restrain myself let me tell you that i won't have anything to do with it i have decided to drop everything every one i don't care i am going away i ceased suddenly for i realized what i was doing i felt it degrading to explain my new projects to her she heard me without surprise and without emotion but again a pause followed again she got up went to the door and peeped into the next room having assured herself that there was no one there and we were alone she returned with great composure and sat down in the same place as before you did that prettily i laughed suddenly you are keeping on your lodging at the clerk's she asked suddenly bending a little towards me and dropping her voice as though this question were the chief object for which she had come lodging i don't know perhaps i shall give it up how do i know they are anxiously expecting you the man's very impatient to see you and his wife too andrey petrovitch assured them you'd come back for certain but what is it to you anna andreyevna wanted to know too she was very glad to learn that you were staying how does she know so positively that i shall certainly stay on at that lodging i wanted to add and what is it to her but i refrain from asking through pride and monsieur lambert said the same thing too what monsieur lambert he declared most positively to andrey petrovitch that you would remain and he assured anna andreyevna of it too i felt shaken all over what marvels then lambert already knew versilov lambert had found his way to versilov lambert and anna andreyevna he had found his way to her too i felt overcome with fever but i kept silent my soul was flooded with a terrible rush of pride pride or i don't know what but i suddenly said to myself at that moment if i ask for one word in explanation i shall be involved in that world again and i shall never have done with it there was a glow of hate in my heart i resolutely made up my mind to be mute and to lie without moving she was silent too for a full minute what of prince nikolai ivanovitch i asked suddenly as though i had taken leave of my senses the fact is i asked simply to change the subject and again i chanced to ask the leading question like a madman i plunged back again into that world from which i had just before with such a shudder resolved to flee his honour is at sarkoe silo he is rather poorly and as the hot days have begun in town they all advised him to move to their house at tsarkoe for the sake of the air i made no answer madame and anna andreyevna visit him there twice a week they go together anna andreyevna and madame that is she were friends then 
they go together i did not speak they have become so friendly and anna andreyevna speaks so highly of katerina nikolaevna i still remained silent and katerina nikolaevna is in a whirl of society again it's one fete after another she is making quite a stir they say all the gentlemen at court are in love with her and everything's over with m buring and there's to be no wedding so everybody declares it's been off ever since then that is since versilov's letter i trembled all over but i did not utter a word anna andreyevna is so sorry about prince sergey and katerina nikolaevna too and they all say that he will be acquitted and that stebolkoff will be condemned i looked at her with hatred she got up and suddenly bent down to me anna andreyevna particularly told me to find out how you are she said quite in a whisper and she particularly begged you to go and see her as soon as you begin to go out good-bye make haste and get well and i'll tell her she went away i sat on the edge of the bed a cold sweat came out on my forehead but i did not feel terror the incredible and grotesque news about lambert and his machinations did not for instance fill me with horror in the least as might have been expected from the dread perhaps unaccountable with which during my illness and the early days of my convalescence i recalled my meeting with him on that night on the contrary in that first moment of confusion as i sat on the bed after daria anisimovna had gone my mind did not dwell on lambert but more than all i thought about the news of her of her rupture with buring and of her success in society of her fetes of her triumphs of the stir she was making she's making quite a stir daria anisimovna's phrase was ringing in my ears and i suddenly felt that i had not the strength to struggle out of that whirlpool i had known how to control myself to hold my tongue and not to question daria anisimovna after her tales of marvels an overwhelming thirst for that life for their life took possession of my whole spirit and and another blissful thirst which i felt as a keen joy and an intense pain my thoughts were in a whirl but i let them whirl why be reasonable i felt even mother kept lambert's coming a secret i thought in incoherent snatches versilov must have told her not to speak of it i would rather die than ask versilov about lambert versilov the thought flashed upon me again versilov and lambert oh what a lot that's new among them bravo versilov he frightened the german buring with that letter he libelled her la calomnie il en reste toujours quelque chose and the german courtier was afraid of the scandal ha ha it's a lesson for her lambert surely lambert hasn't found his way to her to be sure he has why shouldn't she have an intrigue with him at this point i suddenly gave up pondering on this senseless tangle and sank back in despair with my head on my pillow but it shall not be i exclaimed with sudden determination i jumped out of bed put on my slippers and dressing-gown and went straight to makar ivanovitch's room as though there were in it a talisman to repel all enticements a means of salvation and an anchor to which i could cling it may really have been that i was feeling this at the time with my whole soul else why should i have leaped up with such a sudden and irresistible impulse and rushed into makar ivanovitch in such a state of mind three but to my surprise i found other people my mother and the doctor with makar ivanovitch as i had for some reason imagined i should find the old man alone as he had been yesterday i stopped short in the doorway in blank amazement before i had time to frown versilov came in followed by liza so they had all met for some reason in makar ivanovitch's room just when they were not wanted i have come to ask how you are i said going straight up to makar ivanovitch thank you my dear i was expecting you 
i knew you would come i was thinking of you in the night he looked into my face caressingly and i saw that perhaps he liked me best of them all but i could not help seeing instantly that though his face was cheerful his illness had made progress in the night the doctor had only just been examining him very seriously i learned afterwards that the doctor the same young man with whom i had quarrelled had been treating makar ivanovitch ever since he arrived had been very attentive to the patient and had diagnosed a complication of various diseases in him but i don't know their medical terms makar ivanovitch as i observed from the first glance was on the warmest friendliest terms with him i disliked that at the instant but i was of course in a very bad mood at the moment yes alexander semyonovitch how is our dear invalid to-day inquired versilov if i had not been so agitated it would have been most interesting to me to watch versilov's attitude to this old man i had wondered about it the day before what struck me most of all now was the extremely soft and pleasant expression in versilov's face there was something perfectly sincere in it i have noted already i believe that versilov's face became wonderfully beautiful as soon as it became ever so little kindly why we keep quarrelling answered the doctor with makar ivanovitch i don't believe it it's impossible to quarrel with him but he won't obey he doesn't sleep at night come give over alexander semyonovitch that's enough scolding said makar ivanovitch laughing well andrei petrovitch how have they treated our good lady here she's been sighing and moaning all the morning she's worrying he added indicating mother ach andrei petrovitch cried my mother who was really very uneasy do make haste and tell us don't keep us in suspense how has it been settled for her poor thing they have found her guilty and sentenced her ach cried my mother but not to siberia don't distress yourself to a fine of fifteen roubles that's all it was a farce he sat down the doctor sat down too they were talking of tatiana pavlovna i knew nothing yet of what had happened i sat down on makar ivanovitch's left and liza sat opposite me on the right she evidently had some special sorrow of her own to-day with which she had come to my mother there was a look of uneasiness and irritation in her face at that moment we exchanged glances and i thought to myself we are both disgraced and i must make the first advances my heart was suddenly softened to her versilov meanwhile had begun describing what had happened that morning it seemed that tatiana pavlovna had had to appear before the justice of the peace that morning on a charge brought against her by her cook the whole affair was utterly absurd i have mentioned already that the ill-tempered cook would sometimes when she was sulky refuse to speak and would not say a word to her mistress for a whole week at a time i mentioned too tatiana's weakness in regard to her how she put up with anything from her and absolutely refused to get rid of her all these whimsical caprices of old maiden ladies are in my eyes utterly beneath contempt and so undeserving of attention and i only mention this story here because this cook is destined to play a leading and momentous part in the sequel of my story so tatiana pavlovna driven out of all patience by the obstinate finnish woman who had refused to answer a word for several days had suddenly at last struck her a thing she had never done before even then the cook did not utter the slightest sound but the same day she communicated the fact to a discharged midshipman called osiatrov who earned a precarious existence by undertaking cases of various sorts and of course by getting up such cases as this for the courts it had ended in tatiana pavlovna's being summoned before the justice of the peace and when the case was tried versilov had for some reason appeared as a witness versilov described all this with extraordinary gaiety and humour so that even mother laughed he even mimicked tatiana pavlovna and the midshipman and the cook the cook had from the very beginning announced to the court that she wanted a money fine 
for if they put my mistress in prison whom am i going to cook for in answer to the judge tatiana pavlovna answered with immense condescension not even deigning to defend herself on the contrary she had concluded with the words i did beat her and i shall do it again whereupon she was promptly fined three roubles for her impudent answer the midshipman a lean lanky young man would have begun with a long speech in defence of his client but broke down disgracefully to the amusement of the whole court the hearing was soon over and tatiana pavlovna was condemned to pay fifteen roubles to the injured maria tatiana pavlovna promptly drew out her purse and proceeded on the spot to pay the money whereupon the midshipman at once approached her and was putting out his hand to take it but tatiana pavlovna thrust aside his hand almost with a blow and turned to maria don't you trouble madam you needn't put yourself out put it down in our accounts i'll settle with this fellow see maria what a lanky fellow you've picked out for yourself said tatiana pavlovna pointing to the midshipman hugely delighted that maria had spoken to her at last he is a lanky one to be sure maria answered slyly did you order cutlets with peas i did not hear this morning i was in a hurry to get here oh no with cabbage maria and please don't burn it to a cinder as you did yesterday no i'll do my best to-day madam let me have your hand and she kissed her mistress's hand in token of reconciliation she entertained the whole court in fact ah what a woman said mother shaking her head very much pleased with the news and andrei petrovitch's account of it though she looked uneasily on the sly at liza she has been a self-willed lady from her childhood smiled makar ivanovitch spleen and idleness opined the doctor is it i am self-willed is it i am spleen and idleness asked tatiana pavlovna coming in upon us suddenly evidently very well pleased with herself it's not for you to talk nonsense alexander semyonovitch when you were ten years old you knew whether i was idle and you've been treating yourself for spleen for the last year and have not been able to cure yourself so you ought to be ashamed well you've picked me to pieces enough thanks for troubling to come to the court andrei petrovitch well how are you makarushka it's only you i've come to see not this fellow she pointed to me but at once gave me a friendly pat on the shoulder i had never before seen her in such a good humour well how is he turning suddenly to the doctor and frowning anxiously why he won't lie in bed and he only tires himself out sitting up like this why i only sit up like this a little with company makar ivanovitch murmured with a face of entreaty like a child's yes we like this we like this we like a little gossip when our friends gather round us i know makarushka said tatiana pavlovna yes you're a quick one you are and there's no getting over you wait a bit let me speak i'll lie down darling i'll obey but you know to my thinking if you take to your bed you may never get up that's what i've got at the back of my head friend to be sure i knew that was it peasant superstitions if i take to my bed they say ten to one i shan't get up that's what the peasants very often fear and they would rather keep on their legs when they're ill than go to a hospital as for you makar ivanovitch you're simply homesick for freedom and the open road that's all that's the matter with you you got out of the habit of staying long in one place why you're what's called a pilgrim aren't you and tramping is almost a passion in our peasantry i've noticed it more than once in them our peasants are tramps before everything then makar is a tramp according to you tatiana pavlovna caught him up oh i did not mean that i used the word in a general sense well yes a religious tramp though he is a holy man yet he is a tramp in a good respectful sense but a tramp i speak from the medical point of view i assure you i address the doctor suddenly that you and i and all the rest here are more like tramps 
than this old man from whom you and i ought to learn too because he has a firm footing in life while we all of us have no firm standpoint at all but how should you understand that though i spoke very cuttingly it seemed but i had come in feeling upset i don't know why i went on sitting there and felt as though i were beside myself what are you saying said tatiana pavlovna looking at me suspiciously how did you find him makar ivanovitch she asked pointing her finger at me god bless him he's a sharp one said the old man with a serious air but at the words sharp one almost every one laughed i controlled myself somehow the doctor laughed more than any one it was rather unlucky that i did not know at the time of a previous compact between them versilov the doctor and tatiana pavlovna had agreed three days before to do all they could to distract mother from brooding and apprehension on account of makar ivanovitch whose illness was far more dangerous and hopeless than i had any suspicion of then that's why they were all making jokes and trying to laugh only the doctor was stupid and did not know how to make jokes naturally that was the cause of all that followed if i had known of their agreement at that time i should not have done what i did liza knew nothing either i sat listening with half my mind they talked and laughed and all the time my head was full of daria onisimovna and her news and i could not shake off the thought of her i kept picturing how she had sat and looked and had cautiously got up and peeped into the next room at last they all suddenly laughed tatiana pavlovna i don't in the least know why called the doctor an infidel why all you doctors are infidels makar ivanovitch said the doctor very stupidly pretending to be offended and to be appealing to him as an umpire am i an infidel you an infidel no you are not an infidel the old man answered sedately looking at him instantly no thank god he said shaking his head you are a merry-hearted man and if a man's merry-hearted he is not an infidel the doctor observed ironically that's in its own way an idea observed versilov he was not laughing however it's a great idea i could not help exclaiming struck by the thought the doctor looked round inquiringly these learned people these same professors probably they had been talking about professors just before began makar ivanovitch looking down at the beginning off i was frightened of them i was in terror in their presence for i dreaded an infidel more than anything i have only one soul i used to think what if i lose it i shan't be able to find another but afterwards i plucked up heart after all i thought they are not gods but just the same as we are men of like passions with ourselves and my curiosity was great i shall find out i thought what this infidelity is like but afterwards even that curiosity passed over he paused though he meant to go on still with the same gentle sedate smile there are simple souls who put complete trust in every one and have no suspicion of mockery such people are always of limited intelligence for they are always ready to display all that is precious in their hearts to every newcomer but in makar ivanovitch i fancied there was something else and the impulse that led him to speak was different and not only the innocence of simplicity one caught glimpses as it were of the missionary in him i even caught with pleasure some sly glances he bent upon the doctor and even perhaps on versilov the conversation was evidently a continuation of a previous discussion between them the week before but unluckily the fatal phrase which had so electrified me the day before cropped up in it again and led me to an outburst which i regret to this day i am afraid of the unbeliever even now perhaps the old man went on with concentrated intensity only friend alexander semyonovitch i tell you what i have never met an infidel but i have met worldly men that's what one must call them they are of all sorts big and little ignorant and learned 
and even some of the humblest class but it's all vanity they read and argue all their lives filling themselves with the sweetness of books while they remain in perplexity and can come to no conclusion some quite let themselves go and give up taking notice of themselves some grow harder than a stone and their hearts are full of wandering dreams others become heartless and frivolous and all they can do is to mock and jeer another will out of books gather some flowers and those according to his own fancy but he still is full of vanity and there is no decision in him and then again there is a great deal of dreariness the small man is in want he has no bread and naught to keep his babes alive with he sleeps on rough straw and all the time his heart is light and merry he is coarse and sinful yet his heart is light but the great man drinks too much and eats too much and sits on a pile of gold yet there is nothing in his heart but gloom some have been through all the sciences and are still depressed and i fancy that the more intellect a man has the greater his dreariness and then again they have been teaching ever since the world began and to what good purpose have they taught that the world might be fairer and merrier and the abode of every sort of joy and another thing i must tell you they have no seemliness they don't even want it at all all are ruined but they boast of their own destruction but to return to the one truth they never think and to live without god is naught but torment and it seems that we curse that whereby we are enlightened and know it not ourselves and what's the sense of it it's impossible to be a man and not bow down to something such a man could not bear the burden of himself nor could there be such a man if he rejects god then he bows down to an idol fashioned of wood or gold or thought they are all idolaters and not infidels that is how we ought to describe them though we can't say there are no infidels there are men who are downright infidels only they are far more terrible than those others for they come with god's name on their lips i have heard of them more than once but i have not met them at all there are such friend and i fancy too that there are bound to be there are makar ivanovitch versilov agreed suddenly there are such and there are bound to be there certainly are and there are certainly bound to be i burst out hotly and impulsively i don't know why but i was carried away by versilov's tone and fascinated by a sort of idea in the words there are bound to be the conversation was an absolute surprise to me but at that minute something happened also quite unexpected four it was a very bright day by the doctor's orders makar ivanovitch's blind was as a rule not drawn up all day but there was a curtain over the window now instead of the blind so that the upper part of the window was not covered this was because the old man was miserable at not seeing the sun at all when he had the blind and as we were sitting there the sun's rays fell suddenly full upon makar ivanovitch's face at first absorbed in conversation he took no notice of it but mechanically as he talked he several times turned his head on one side because the bright sunlight hurt and irritated his bad eyes mother standing beside him glanced several times uneasily towards the window all that was wanted was to screen the window completely with something but to avoid interrupting the conversation she thought it better to try and move the bench on which makar ivanovitch was sitting a little to the right it did not need to be moved more than six or at the most eight inches she had bent down several times and taken hold of the bench but could not move it the bench with makar ivanovitch sitting on it would not move feeling her efforts unconsciously in the heat of conversation makar ivanovitch several times tried to get up but his legs would not obey him but mother went on straining all her strength to move it and at last all this exasperated liza horribly i noticed several angry irritated looks from her but for the first moment i did not know to what to ascribe them besides i was carried away by the conversation and i suddenly heard her almost shout sharply to makar ivanovitch do get up 
if it's ever so little you see how hard it is for mother the old man looked at her quickly instantly grasped her meaning and hurriedly tried to stand up but without success he raised himself a couple of inches and fell back on the bench i can't my dearie he answered plaintively looking as it were meekly at liza you can talk by the hour together but you haven't the strength to stir an inch liza cried tatiana pavlovna makar ivanovitch made another great effort take your crutches they are lying beside you you can get up with your crutches liza snapped out again to be sure said the old man and he made haste to pick up his crutches he must be lifted said versilov standing up the doctor too moved and tatiana pavlovna ran up but before they had time to reach him makar ivanovitch leaning on the crutches with a tremendous effort suddenly raised himself and stood up looking round with a triumphant air there i have got up he said almost with pride laughing gleefully thank you my dear you have taught me a lesson and i thought that my poor legs would not obey me at all but he did not remain standing long he had hardly finished speaking when his crutch on which he was leaning with the whole weight of his body somehow slipped on the rug and as his poor legs were scarcely any support at all he fell heavily full length on the floor i remember it was almost horrible to see all cried out and rushed to lift him up but thank god he had broken no bones he had only knocked his knees with a heavy thud against the floor but he had succeeded in putting out his right hand and breaking his fall with it he was picked up and seated on the bed he was very pale not from fright but from the shock the doctor had told them that he was suffering more from disease of the heart than anything mother was beside herself with fright and still pale trembling all over and still a little bewildered makar ivanovitch turned suddenly to liza and almost tenderly in a soft voice said to her no my dearie my legs really won't hold me i cannot express what an impression this made on me at the time there was not the faintest note of complaint or reproach in the poor old man's words on the contrary it was perfectly evident that he had not noticed anything spiteful in liza's words and had accepted her shout as something quite befitting that is that it was quite right to pitch into him for his remissness all this had a very great effect on liza too at the moment when he fell she had rushed forward like all the rest of us and stood numb with horror and miserable of course at having caused it all hearing his words she almost instantly flushed crimson with shame and remorse that's enough tatiana pavlovna commanded suddenly this comes of talking too much it's time we were off it's a bad lookout when the doctor himself begins to chatter quite so assented alexander semyonovitch who was occupied with the invalid i'm to blame tatiana pavlovna he needs rest but tatiana pavlovna did not hear him she had been for half a minute watching liza intently come here liza and kiss me that is if you care to kiss an old fool like me she said unexpectedly and she kissed the girl i don't know why but it seemed exactly the right thing to do so that i almost rushed to kiss tatiana pavlovna myself what was fitting was not to overwhelm liza with reproach but to welcome with joy and congratulation the new feeling that must certainly have sprung up in her but instead of all those feelings i suddenly stood up and rapped out resolutely makar ivanovitch you used again the word seemliness and i have been worrying about that word yesterday and all these days in fact all my life i have been worrying about it only i didn't know what it was this coincidence i look upon as momentous almost miraculous i say this in your presence but i was instantly checked i repeat i did not know their compact about mother and makar ivanovitch they considered me of course judging from my doings in the past capable of making a scene of any sort stop him stop him cried tatiana pavlovna utterly infuriated mother began trembling makar ivanovitch seeing the general alarm was alarmed too arkady hush versilov cried sternly for me my friends i said raising my voice 
to see you all beside this babe i indicated makar is unseemly there is only one saint here and that is mother and even she you are alarming him the doctor said emphatically i know i am the enemy to every one in the world or something of the sort i began faltering but looking round once more i glared defiantly at Versilov. arcady he cried again just such a scene has happened once here already between us i entreat you restrain yourself now i cannot describe the intense feeling with which he said this a deep sadness sincere and complete was manifest in his face what was most surprising was that he looked as though he were guilty as though i were the judge and he were the criminal this was the last straw for me yes i shouted to him and replied just such a scene we had before when i buried versilov and tore him out of my heart but then there followed a resurrection from the dead but now now there will be no rising again but but all of you here shall see what i am capable of you have no idea what i can show you saying this i rushed into my room versilov ran after me five i had a relapse i had a violent attack of fever and by nightfall was delirious but i was not all the time in delirium i had innumerable dreams shapeless and following one another in endless succession one such dream or fragment of a dream i shall remember as long as i live i will describe it without attempting to explain it it was prophetic and i cannot leave it out i suddenly found myself with my heart full of a grand and proud design in a large lofty room i remember the room very well it was not at tatiana pavlovna's i may observe anticipating events but although i was alone i felt continually with uneasiness and discomfort that i was not alone at all that i was awaited and that something was being expected of me somewhere outside the door people were sitting and waiting for what i was going to do the sensation was unendurable oh if i could only be alone and suddenly she walked in she looked at me timidly she was very much afraid she looked into my eyes in my hand i had the letter she smiled to fascinate me she fawned upon me i was sorry but i began to feel repulsion suddenly she hid her face in her hands i flung the letter on the table with unutterable disdain as much as to say you needn't beg take it i want nothing of you i revenge myself for all your insults by contempt i went out of the room choking with immense pride but at the door lambert clutched me in the darkness fool fool he whispered holding me by the arm with all his might she will have to open a high-class boarding-house for wenches in vasilyevsky's island note well to get her living if her father hearing of the letter from me were to deprive her of her inheritance and drive her out of the house i quote what lambert said word for word as i dreamed it arkady makarovitch is in quest of seemliness i heard the low voice of anna andreyevna somewhere close by on the stairs but there was a note not of approval but of insufferable mockery in her words i returned to the room with lambert but seeing lambert she began to laugh my first impression was one of horrible dismay such dismay as that i stopped short and would not go up to her i stared at her and could not believe my eyes as though she had just thrown off a mask the features were the same but each feature seemed distorted by an insolence that was beyond all bounds the ransom the ransom madam cried lambert and both laughed louder than ever while my heart went cold oh can that shameless creature be the woman one glance from whom set my heart glowing with virtue you see what these proud creatures in their good society are ready to do for money cried lambert but the shameless creature was not even abashed by that she laughed at my being so horrified oh she was ready to pay the ransom that i saw and and what came over me i no longer felt pity or disgust i was thrilled as i had never been before i was overwhelmed by a new and indescribable feeling such as i had never known before and strong as life itself i could not have gone away now for anything on earth oh how it pleased me that it was so shameful i clutched her hands the touch of her hands sent an agonizing thrill through me and i put my lips to her insolent crimson lips that invited me quivering with laughter 
oh away with that vile memory a cursed dream i swear that until that loathsome dream nothing like that shameful idea had ever been in my mind there had never been even an unconscious dream of the sort though i had kept the letter sewn up in my pocket and i sometimes gripped my pocket with a strange smile how was it all this came to me so complete it was because i had the soul of a spider it shows that all this had long ago been hatching in my corrupt heart and laid latent in my desires but my waking heart was still ashamed and my mind dared not consciously picture anything of the sort but in sleep the soul presented and laid bare all that was hidden in the heart with the utmost accuracy in a complete picture and in prophetic form and was that what i had threatened to show them when i had run out of makar ivanovitch's room that morning but enough for the time no more of this that dream is one of the strangest things that has happened in my life End of part three chapter two part three chapter three of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a raw youth by fyodor dostoyevsky translated by constance garnet part three chapter three one three days later i got up from my bed and as soon as i was on my legs i felt that i should not go back to it again i felt all over that convalescence was at hand all these little details perhaps would not be worth writing but then several days followed which were not remarkable for anything special that happened and yet have remained in my memory as something soothing and consolatory and that is rare in my reminiscences i will not for the time attempt to define my spiritual condition if i were to give an account of it the reader would scarcely believe in it it will be better for it to be made clear by facts themselves and so i will only say one thing let the reader remember the soul of the spider and that in the man who longed to get away from them all and from the whole world for the sake of seemliness the longing for seemliness was still there of course and very intense but how it could be linked with other longings of a very different sort is a mystery to me it always has been a mystery and i have marvelled a thousand times at that faculty in man and in the russian i believe more especially of cherishing in his soul his loftiest ideal side by side with the most abject baseness and all quite sincerely whether this is a breadth in the russian which takes him so far or simply baseness that is the question but enough of that however that may be a time of calm followed all i knew was that i must get well at all costs and as quickly as possible that i might as soon as possible begin to act and so i resolved to live hygienically and to obey the doctor whoever he might be disturbing projects i put off with great good sense the fruit of this same breath to the day of my escape that is to the day of my complete recovery how all the peaceful impressions and sensations in that time of stillness were consistent with the painfully sweet and agitated throbbings of my heart when i dreamed of violent decisions i do not know but again i put it all down to brett but there was no trace now of the restlessness i had suffered from of late i put it all off for the time and did not tremble at the thought of the future as i had so recently but looked forward to it like a wealthy man relying on his power and his resources i felt more and more proud and defiant of the fate awaiting me and this was partly due i imagine to my actual return to health and the rapid recovery of my vital forces those few days of final and complete recovery i recall even now with great pleasure oh they forgave me everything that is my outburst and these were the people whom i had called unseemly to their faces that i love 
in people that is what i call intelligence of the heart anyway this attracted me at once to a certain degree of course Versilov and i for instance talked together like the best of friends but only to a certain point if at times we became ever so little too expansive and we were over expansive at times we pulled ourselves up at once as though a trifle ashamed of something there are cases when the victor cannot help feeling abashed before the vanquished and just because he has gained the upper hand over him i was evidently the victor and i was ashamed that morning that is the one on which i got up again after my relapse he came in to see me and then i learned from him for the first time of their compact in regard to mother and makar ivanovitch he added that though the old man was better the doctor would not answer for the future i promised him with my whole heart that i would be more careful of my behaviour in the future while versilov was telling me all this i detected for the first time that he was most genuinely concerned about the old man far more indeed than i could have expected from a man like him and that he looked upon him as a being for some reason particularly precious to himself not simply for mother's sake this at once interested me and almost surprised me and i must confess if it had not been for versilov i should have overlooked and failed to appreciate a great deal in this old man who has left one of the most lasting and original impressions on my mind versilov seemed to be afraid of my attitude to makar ivanovitch that is he distrusted my intelligence and my tact and he was therefore particularly pleased afterwards when he discerned that i knew how to behave with a man of quite different ideas and conceptions could in fact be broad-minded and make allowances i must confess too and i don't think it's humiliating to do so that in this man of the people i found something absolutely new to me in regard to certain feelings and conceptions something i had known nothing of something far more serene and consolatory than my own previous ideas on those subjects it was none the less impossible sometimes to keep from being impatient at some positive superstitions in which he believed with the most revolting placidity and steadfastness but this of course was only due to his lack of education his soul was rather happily constructed so much so that i have never met a man superior in that respect two what attracted one first of all as i have observed already was his extraordinary pure-heartedness and his freedom from amour propre one felt instinctively that he had an almost sinless heart he had gaiety of heart and therefore seemliness the word gaiety he was very fond of and often used he sometimes showed an almost abnormal exaltation an almost abnormal fervour partly i imagine because the fever never really left him but that did not mar his beautiful serenity there were contrasts in him too side by side with his marvellous simplicity at times to my vexation he completely failed to detect irony there was a sort of sly subtlety most frequently apparent in controversy and he was fond of controversy though at times only through caprice it was evident that he had been on foot over a great part of russia had heard a great deal but i repeat what he liked best of all was religious emotion and therefore everything that led up to it and he was fond of telling incidents that moved one to tenderness and reverence he was fond of telling stories in general i listened to many tales from him of his own wanderings and various legends of the lives of the 
ascetics of ancient times i am not familiar with these stories but i believe that he told them all wrong adapting them for the most part from the traditions current among the peasantry it was simply impossible to accept some of his versions but together with evident distortions or even inventions there were continual flashes of something wonderfully complete full of peasant feeling and always touching i recall for instance one long story out of the life of maria of egypt of this life and of all such lives i had had no idea at all till then i frankly confess that it was almost impossible to hear the story without tears not from tender feeling but from a sort of strange ecstasy one felt something strange and burning like the parched sandy desert upon which the holy woman wandered among lions i don't want to talk of this though and indeed i am not competent to do so apart from the tender feeling of his stories i particularly liked certain extremely original views on disputed questions of modern life he told me once for instance of something that had happened recently with a retired soldier he had almost witnessed the incident a soldier had come home to his village from serving in the army and did not like going back to live with peasants the peasants did not like him either the man went wrong took to drinking and robbed some one there was no strong evidence against him but he was taken up and tried the lawyer was defending him successfully there was no proof against him but suddenly after listening a long time the prisoner suddenly stood up and interrupted him no you stop said he and then he told the whole story to the tiniest grain of dust he confessed his full guilt with tears and penitence the jury went out were shut up to confer and suddenly they all came back no not guilty everyone shouted and rejoiced and the soldier stood rooted to the spot he seemed turned into a post and couldn't make head or tail of it he didn't understand a word of the judge's exhortation to him when he dismissed him the soldier came out to freedom and still couldn't believe it he began to fret sank into brooding gave up eating and drinking spoke to no one and on the fifth day he took and hanged himself that's what it is to live with sin on the soul said makar ivanovitch in conclusion of course that's a foolish story and there are masses of such stories nowadays in all the newspapers but i liked his tone and most of all some phrases of quite a new significance describing for instance how the soldier was disliked by the peasants when he went back to the village makar ivanovitch used the expression and we know what a soldier is a soldier's a peasant spoilt speaking afterwards of the lawyer who had almost won the case he said we know what a lawyer is a lawyer's a conscience for hire both these expressions he brought out without effort and almost without noticing them and yet those two utterances revealed a complete and special attitude of mind on those subjects not borrowed but peculiar to makar ivanovitch if not to the whole peasantry these judgments among the peasants in regard to certain subjects are sometimes really marvellous in their originality and how do you look upon the sin of suicide makar ivanovitch i asked him apropos of the same story suicide is the greatest human sin he answered with a sigh but god alone is judge of it for he alone knows all every limit every measure we must pray without ceasing for such sinners whenever you hear of such a sin pray fervently at bedtime for the sinner if only you breathe a sigh for him to god even though you don't know his name the more acceptable will be your prayer for him but will my prayer be any help to him if he is condemned already 
how can you tell there are many ah many without faith who thereby confound those of little knowledge heed them not for they know not what foolishness they are speaking the prayer of the living for the condemned may still in truth benefit him so what a plight for him who has no one to pray for him therefore at your evening prayer say also at the end lord jesus have mercy on all those also who have none to pray for them very acceptable and pleasant will be this prayer also for all living sinners lord who holdest all destinies in thy hand save all sinners that repent not that too is a good prayer i promised him i would pray feeling that i was giving him immense pleasure by this promise and his face did in fact beam with joy but i hastened to add that in such cases he did not take up a superior attitude to me as a monk speaking to a raw youth on the contrary he very often liked listening to me he was never weary in fact of hearing me talk on various subjects realizing that though a youth i was immeasurably superior to him in education he was very fond for instance of talking of the life of hermits in the desert and thought of the desert as something far above pilgrimage i hotly opposed him laying stress on the egoism of these people who had abandoned the world and all the services they might have rendered mankind simply with the egoistic idea of their own salvation at first he didn't quite understand i suspect indeed he didn't understand at all but he zealously defended the desert at first of course one grieves that is when first one goes to dwell in the desert but then each day one is more glad at heart and at last one looks upon the face of god then i drew a picture to him of the useful activity in the world of the man of science the doctor or any friend of humanity and roused him to real enthusiasm for i spoke with warmth he kept eagerly assenting to my words that's so dear that's so god bless you your thoughts are true but when i had finished he did not seem to agree entirely to be sure to be sure he sighed deeply but are there many who hold fast and are not led astray though money be not their god yet it is a demigod a great temptation and then there's the female sex and then doubt and envy and so they will forget their great work and will be absorbed in little things but in the desert a man strengthens himself for every great deed my dear what is there in the world he exclaimed with intense feeling but is it only a dream take a grain of sand and sow it on a stone when that yellow grain of sand of yours on the stone springs up then your dream will come true in the world that's a saying of ours very different from christ's go and give all that thou hast to the poor and become the servant of all then thou wilt be a thousandfold richer than ever before for not by bread alone not by rich garments not by pride not by envy wilt thou be happy but by love multiplied immeasurably not a little riches not a hundred thousand not a million but the whole world wilt thou gain now we gather and have not enough and squander senselessly but then there will be no orphans nor beggars for all will be my people all will be akin i have gained all i have bought all every one now it is no uncommon thing for the rich and powerful to care nothing for the length of their days and to be at a loss to invent a pastime then thy days and thy hours will be multiplied a thousandfold for thou wilt grudge the loss of a single minute and wilt rejoice in every minute in gaiety of heart then thou wilt attain wisdom not from books alone but wilt be face to face with god himself and the earth will shine more brightly than the sun and there shall be no more sorrow nor sighing nothing but one priceless paradise it was these enthusiastic outbursts that i believe versalov liked particularly he was in the room on this occasion makar ivanovitch i interrupted suddenly feeling immensely stirred myself 
i remember that evening why it's communism absolute communism you're preaching and as he knew absolutely nothing of the doctrine of communism and heard the word indeed for the first time i began at once expounding to him all i knew on the subject i must confess my knowledge was scanty and confused even now in fact it is not very ample but in spite of that i discoursed with great heat on what i did know to this day i recall with pleasure the extraordinary impression i made on the old man it was more than an impression it was really an overwhelming effect he was passionately interested too in the historical details asking where how who arranged it who said so i have noticed by the way that that is characteristic of the russian peasant if he is much interested he is not content with general ideas but insists on having the most solid and exact facts it was just for such details that i was at a loss and as versilov was present i felt ashamed of my incompetence and that made me hotter than ever in the end makar ivanovitch could do nothing but repeat with emotion yes yes though he had evidently lost the thread and did not understand i felt vexed but versilov interrupted the conversation and said it was bedtime we were all in the room and it was late but when he peeped into my room a few minutes later i asked him at once what he thought of makar ivanovitch and what was his opinion of him versilov laughed gaily but not at my mistakes about communism he did not mention them in fact i repeat again he seemed absolutely devoted to makar ivanovitch and i often caught a very attractive smile on his face when he was listening to the old man at the same time this smile did not prevent his criticising him makar ivanovitch is above all not a peasant but a house serf he pronounced with great readiness who has been a servant born a servant and of servants the house serfs and servants used to share a very great deal in the interests of their master's private spiritual and intellectual life in the past note that to this day makar ivanovitch is most interested in the life of the gentry and upper class you don't know yet how much interest he takes in recent events in russia do you know that he is a great politician don't feed him on honey but tell him where any one is fighting and whether we are going to fight in old days i used to delight him by such accounts he has the greatest respect for science and of all sciences is fondest of astronomy at the same time he has worked out for himself something so independent that nothing you could do would shake it he has convictions firm fairly clear and genuine though he's so absolutely uneducated he is often able to astound one by his surprising knowledge of certain ideas which one would never have expected to find in him he extols the desert with enthusiasm but nothing would induce him to retire to the desert or enter a monastery because he is above all things a tramp as he was so charmingly called by alexander Samyanovitch and by the way there's no need for you to be angry with him well and what more he's something of an artist many of his sayings are his own though some are not he's somewhat halting in his logic and at times too abstract he has moods of sentimentality but of a thoroughly peasant kind or rather moods of that tenderness universally found among peasants which the people introduce so freely into their religious feelings as for his purity of heart and freedom from malice i won't discuss them it's not for you and me to begin upon that three to complete my picture of makar ivanovitch i'll repeat some of his stories choosing those taken from private life these stories were of a strange character it was impossible to extract any sort of moral or general tendency from them except perhaps that they were all more or less touching there were some however which were not touching some in fact were quite gay others even made fun of certain foolish monks so that he actually discredited his own convictions by telling them i pointed this out to him but he did not understand what i meant 
sometimes it was difficult to imagine what induced him to tell the story so that at times i wondered at his talkativeness and put it down to the loquacity of old age and his feverish condition he is not what he used to be Versaloff whispered to me once he was not quite like this in the old days he will soon die much sooner than we expect and we must be prepared i have forgotten to say that we had begun to have something like evenings besides my mother who never left him Versaloff was in his little room every evening i came too and indeed i had nowhere else to go of late liza too had always been present though she came a little later than the rest of us and always sat in silence tatiana pavlovna came too and though more rarely the doctor somehow i suddenly began to get on with the doctor and though we were never very friendly there were no further scenes between us i liked a sort of simple-mindedness which i detected in him and the attachment he showed to our family so that i made up my mind at last to forgive him his professional superciliousness and moreover i taught him to wash his hands and clean his nails even if he could put on clean linen i explained to him bluntly that this was not a sign of foppishness or of elegant artificiality but that cleanliness is a natural element of the trade of a doctor and i proved it to him finally lucaria often came out of the kitchen and stood at the door listening to makar ivanovitch's stories Versilov once called her in from the door and asked her to sit down with us i liked his doing this but from that time she gave up coming to the door her sense of the fitting i quote one of his stories selecting it simply because i remember it more completely it is a story about a merchant and i imagine that such incidents occur by thousands in our cities and country towns if only one knew how to look for them the reader may prefer to skip the story especially as i quote it in the old man's words four i'll tell you now of a wonderful thing that happened in our town afimietsk there was a merchant living there his name was skotoborinikov maxim ivanovitch and there was no one richer than he in all the countryside he built a cotton factory and he kept some hundreds of hands and he exalted himself exceedingly and everything one may say was at his beck and call and even those in authority hindered him in nothing and the archimandrite thanked him for his zeal he gave freely of his substance to the monastery and when the fit came upon him he sighed and groaned over his soul and was troubled not a little over the life to come a widower he was and childless of his wife there were tales that he had beaten her from the first year of their marriage and that from his youth up he had been apt to be too free with his hands only all that had happened long ago he had no desire to enter into the bonds of another marriage he had a weakness for strong drink too and when the time came he would run drunk about the town naked and shouting the town was of little account and was full of iniquity and when the time was ended he was moved to anger and all that he thought fit was good and all he bade them do was right he paid his people according to his pleasure he brings out his reckoning beads puts on his spectacles how much for you foma i've had nothing since christmas maxim ivanovitch thirty-nine roubles is my due ah oh, what a sum of money that's too much for you it's more than you're worth altogether it would not be fitting for you ten roubles off the beads and you take twenty-nine and the man says nothing no one dares open his lips all are dumb before him i know how much i ought to give him he says it's the only way to deal with the folk here the folk here are corrupt but for me they would have perished of hunger all that are here the folk here are thieves again they covet all that they behold there is no courage in them they are drunkards too if you pay a man his money he'll take it to the tavern and will sit in the tavern till he's naked not a thread on him he will come out as bare as your hand they are mean wretches a man will sit on a stone facing the tavern and begin wailing oh mother my dear mother why did you bring me into the world a hopeless drunkard 
better you had strangled me at birth a hopeless drunkard like me can you call that a man that's a beast not a man one must first teach him better and then give him money i know when to give it him that's how maxim ivanovitch used to talk of the folk of afimyevsk though he spoke evil of them yet it was the truth the folk were froward and unstable there lived in the same town another merchant and he died he was a young man and light-minded he came to ruin and lost all his fortune for the last year he struggled like a fish on the sand and his life drew near its end he was on bad terms with maxim ivanovitch all the time and was heavily in debt to him and he left behind a widow still young and five children and for a young widow to be left alone without a husband like a swallow without a refuge is a great ordeal to say nothing of five little children and nothing to give them to eat their last possession a wooden house maxim ivanovitch had taken for a debt she set them all in a row at the church porch the eldest a boy of seven and the others all girls one smaller than another the biggest of them four and the youngest babe at the breast when mass was over maxim ivanovitch came out of church and all the little ones all in a row knelt down before him she had told them to do this beforehand and they clasped their little hands before them and she behind them with the fifth child in her arms bowed down to the earth before him in the sight of all the congregation maxim ivanovitch have mercy on the orphans do not take away their last crust do not drive them out of their home and all who were present were moved to tears so well had she taught them she thought that he would be proud before the people and would forgive the debt and give back the house to the orphans but it did not fall out so maxim ivanovitch stood still you're a young widow said he you want a husband you are not weeping over your orphans your husband cursed me on his deathbed and he passed by and did not give up the house why follow their foolishness that is connive at it if i show her benevolence they'll abuse me more than ever all that nonsense will be revived and the slander will only be confirmed for there was a story that ten years before he had sent to that widow before she was married and had offered her a great sum of money she was very beautiful forgetting that that sin is no less than defiling the temple of god but he did not succeed then in his evil design of such abominations he had committed not a few both in the town and all over the province and indeed had gone beyond all bounds in such doings the mother wailed with her nurslings he turned the orphans out of the house and not from spite only for indeed a man sometimes does not know himself what drives him to carry out his will well people helped her at first and then she went out to work for hire but there was little to be earned save at the factory she scrubs floors weeds in the garden heats the bath-house and she carries the babe in her arms and the other four run about the streets in their little shirts when she made them kneel down at the church porch they still had little shoes and little jackets of a sort for they were merchants children but now they began to run barefoot a child soon gets through its little clothes we know well the children didn't care so long as there was sunshine they rejoiced like birds did not feel their ruin and their voices were like little bells the widow thought the winter will come and what shall i do with you then if god would only take you to him before then but she had not to wait for the winter about our parts the children have a cough the whooping cough which goes from one to the other first of all the baby died and after her the others fell ill and all four little girls she buried that autumn one after the other one of them it's true was trampled by the horses in the street and what do you think she buried them and she wailed though she had cursed them yet when god took them she was sorry a mother's heart all she had left was the eldest the boy and she hung over him trembling he was weak and tender with a pretty little face like a girl's and she took him to the factory to the foreman who was his godfather and she herself took a place as nurse 
but one day the boy was running in the yard and maxim ivanovitch suddenly drove up with a pair of horses and he had just been drinking and the boy came rushing down the steps straight at him and slipped and stumbled right against him as he was getting out of the droshky and hit him with both hands in the stomach he seized the boy by the hair and yelled whose boy is it a birch thrash him before me this minute the boy was half dead with fright they began thrashing him he screamed so you scream too do you thrash him till he leaves off screaming whether they thrashed him hard or not he didn't give up screaming till he fainted altogether then they left off thrashing him they were frightened the boy lay senseless hardly breathing they did say afterwards they had not beaten him much but the boy was terrified maxim ivanovitch was frightened whose boy is he he asked when they told him upon my word take him to his mother why is he hanging about the factory here for two days afterwards he said nothing then he asked again how's the boy and it had gone hard with the boy he had fallen ill and lay in the corner at his mother's and she had given up her job to look after him and inflammation of the lungs had set in upon my word said maxim ivanovitch and for so little it's not as though he were badly beaten they only gave him a bit of a fright i've given all the others just a sounder thrashing and never had this nonsense he expected the mother to come and complain and in his pride he said nothing as though that were likely the mother didn't dare to complain and then he sent her fifteen roubles from himself and a doctor and not because he was afraid but because he thought better of it and then soon his time came and he drank for three weeks winter passed and at the holy ascension of our lord maxim ivanovitch asks again and how's that same boy and all the winter he'd been silent and not asked and they told him he's better and living with his mother and she goes out by the day and maxim ivanovitch went that day to the widow he didn't go into the house but called her out to the gate while he sat in his droshky see now honest widow says he i want to be a real benefactor to your son and to show him the utmost favour i will take him from here into my house and if the boy pleases me i'll settle a decent fortune on him and if i'm completely satisfied with him i may at my death make him the heir of my whole property as though he were my own son on condition however that you do not come to the house except on great holidays if this suits you bring the boy to-morrow morning he can't always be playing knuckle-bones and saying this he drove away leaving the mother dazed people had overheard and said to her when the boy grows up he'll reproach you himself for having deprived him of such good fortune in the night she cried over him but in the morning she took the child and the lad was more dead than alive maxim ivanovitch dressed him like a little gentleman and hired a teacher for him and sat him at his book from that hour forward and it came to his never leaving him out of his sight always keeping him with him the boy could scarcely begin to yawn before he'd shouted him mind your book study i want to make a man of you and the boy was frail ever since the time of that beating he'd had a cough as though we didn't live well in my house said maxim ivanovitch wondering at his mother's he used to run barefoot and gnaw crusts why is he more puny than before and the teacher said every boy says he needs to play about not to be studying all the time he needs exercise and he explained it all to him reasonably maxim ivanovitch reflected that's true he said and that teacher's name was Pyotr stepanovitch the kingdom of heaven be his he was almost like a crazy saint he drank much too much indeed and that was the reason he had been turned out of so many places and he lived in the town on alms one may say but he was of great intelligence and strong in science this is not the place for me he thought to himself i ought to be a professor in the university here i'm buried in the mud my very garments loathe me maxim ivanovitch sits and shouts to the child play and he scarcely dares to breathe before him 
and it came to such a pass that the boy could not hear the sound of his voice without trembling all over and maxim ivanovitch wondered more and more he's neither one thing nor the other i picked him out of the mud i dressed him in drap de dame with little boots of gold material he has embroidered shirts like a general's son why has he not grown attached to me why is he as dumb as a little wolf and though people had long given up being surprised at maxim ivanovitch they began to be surprised at him again the man was beside himself he pestered the little child and would never let him alone as sure as i am alive i'll root up his character his father cursed me on his deathbed after he'd taken the last sacrament it's his father's character and yet he didn't once use the birch to him after that time he was afraid to he frightened him that's what he did he frightened him without a birch and something happened one day as soon as he'd gone out the boy left his book and jumped on to a chair he had thrown his ball on to the top of the sideboard and now he wanted to get it and his sleeve caught in a china lamp on the sideboard the lamp fell to the floor and was smashed to pieces and the crash was heard all over the house and it was an expensive thing made of saxony china and maxim ivanovitch heard at once though he was two rooms away and he yelled the boy rushed away in terror he ran out on the veranda across the garden and through the back gate on to the river bank and there was a boulevard running along the river bank there were old willows there it was a pleasant place he ran down to the water people saw and clasped his hands at the very place where the ferry-boat comes in but seemed frightened of the water and stood as though turned to stone and it's a broad open space the river is swift there and boats pass by on the other side there are shops a square a temple of god shining with golden domes and just then madame ferzing the colonel's wife came hurrying down to the ferry with her little daughter the daughter who was also a child of eight was wearing a little white frock she looked at the boy and laughed and she was carrying a little country basket and in it a hedgehog look mother said she how the boy is looking at my hedgehog no said the lady he's frightened of something what are you afraid of pretty boy all this was told afterwards and what a pretty boy she said and how nicely he's dressed whose boy are you she asked and he'd never seen a hedgehog before he went up and looked and forgot everything at once such is childhood what is it you have got there he asked it's a hedgehog said the little lady we've just bought it from a peasant he found it in the woods what's that he asked what is a hedgehog and he began laughing and poking it with his finger and the hedgehog put up its bristles and the little girl was delighted with the boy we'll take it home with us and tame it she said ach said he do give me your hedgehog and he asked her this so pleadingly and he'd hardly uttered the words when maxim ivanovitch came running down upon him ah there you are hold him he was in such a rage that he'd run out of the house after him without a hat then the boy remembered everything he screamed and ran to the water pressed his little fists against his breast looked up at the sky they saw it they saw it and leaped into the water well people cried out and jumped from the ferry tried to get him out but the current carried him away the river was rapid and when they got him out the little thing was dead his chest was weak he couldn't stand being in the water his hold on life was weak and such a thing had never been known in those parts a little child like that to take its life what a sin and what could such a little soul say to our lord god in the world beyond and maxim ivanovitch brooded over it ever after the man became so changed one would hardly have known him he sorrowed grievously he tried drinking and drank heavily but gave it up it was no help he gave up going to the factory too he would listen to no one if any one spoke to him he would be silent or wave his hand so he spent two months and then he began talking to himself he would walk about talking to himself vaskova the little village down the hill caught fire and nine houses were burnt maxim ivanovitch drove up to look 
the peasants whose cottages were burnt came round him wailing he promised to help them and gave orders and then he called his steward again and took it back there's no need said he don't give them anything and he never said why god has sent me to be a scorn unto all men said he like some monster and therefore so be it like the wind said he has my fame gone abroad the archimandrite himself came to him he was a stern man the head of the community of the monastery what are you doing he asked sternly i will tell you and maxim ivanovitch opened the bible and pointed to the passage whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea matthew eighteen six yes said the archimandrite though it was not said directly of this yet it fits it well it is sad when a man loses his measure the man is lost and thou hast exalted thyself and maxim ivanovitch sits as though a stupor had come upon him the archimandrite gazed upon him listen said he and remember it is said the word of a desperate man flies on the wind and remember also that even the angels of god are not perfect but perfect and sinless is one only our lord jesus christ and him the angels serve moreover thou didst not will the death of that child but wast only without wisdom but this said he is marvellous in my eyes thou hast committed many even worse iniquities many men thou hast ruined many thou hast corrupted many thou hast destroyed no less than if thou hadst slain them and did not his sisters all the four babes die almost before thine eyes why has this one only confounded thee for all these in the past thou hast not grieved i dare say but hast even forgotten to think of them why art thou so horror-stricken for this child for whom thou wast not greatly to blame i dream at night maxim ivanovitch said and what but he told nothing more he sat mute the archimandrite marvelled but with that he went away there was no doing anything with him and maxim ivanovitch sent for the teacher for piotr stepanovitch they had not met since that day you remember him says he yes you painted a picture with oil colours here in the tavern said he and took a copy of the chief priest's portrait could you paint me a picture i can do anything i have every talent i can do everything paint me a very big picture to cover the whole wall and paint in it first of all the river and the slope and the ferry and all the people who were there the colonel's wife and her daughter and the hedgehog and paint me the other bank too so that one can see the church and the square and the shops and where the cabs stand paint it all just as it is and the boy by the ferry just above the river at that very place and paint him with his two little fists pressed to his little breast be sure to do that and open the heavens above the church on the further side and let all the angels of heaven be flying to meet him can you do it or not i can do anything i needn't ask a dauber like you i might send for the finest painter in moscow or even from london itself but you remember his face if it's not like or little like i'll only give you fifty roubles but if it's just like i'll give you two hundred you remember his eyes were blue and it must be made a very very big picture it was prepared piotr stepanovitch began painting and then he suddenly went and said no it can't be painted like that why so because that sin suicide is the greatest of all sins and would the angels come to meet him after such a sin but he was a babe he was not responsible no he was not a babe he was a youth he was eight years old when it happened he was bound to render some account maxim ivanovitch was more terror-stricken than ever but i tell you what i've thought something said piotr stepanovitch we won't open the heaven and there's no need to paint the angels but i'll let a beam of light one bright ray of light come down from heaven 
as though to meet him it's all the same as long as there's something so he painted the ray i saw that picture myself afterwards and that very ray of light and the river it stretched right across the wall all blue and the sweet boy was there both little hands pressed to his breast and the little lady and the hedgehog he put it all in only maxim ivanovitch showed no one the picture at the time but locked it up in his room away from all eyes and when the people trooped from all over the town to see it he bade them drive every one away there was a great talk about it piotr stepanovitch seemed as though he were beside himself i can do anything now said he i've only to set up in st petersburg at the court he was a very polite man but he liked boasting beyond all measure and his fate overtook him when he received the full two hundred roubles he began drinking at once and showed his money to every one bragging of it and he was murdered at night when he was drunk and his money stolen by a workman with whom he was drinking and it all became known in the morning and it all ended so that even now they remember it everywhere there maxim ivanovitch suddenly drives up to the same widow she lodged at the edge of the town in a working woman's hut he stood before her and bowed down to the ground and she had been ill ever since that time and could scarcely move good mother he wailed honest widow marry me monster as i am let me live again she looks at him more dead than alive i want us to have another boy said he and if he is born it will mean that that boy has forgiven us both both you and me for so the boy has bidden me she saw the man was out of his mind and in a frenzy but she could not refrain that's all nonsense she answered him and only cowardice through the same cowardice i have lost all my children i cannot bear the sight of you before me let alone accepting such an everlasting torture maxim ivanovitch drove off but he did not give in the whole town was agog at such a marvel maxim ivanovitch sent matchmakers to her he sent for two of his aunts working women in the chief town of the province aunts they were not but kinsfolk of some sort decent people they began trying to turn her they kept persuading her and would not leave the cottage he sent her merchants wives of the town too and the wife of the head priest of the cathedral and the wives of officials she was besieged by the whole town and she got really sick of it if my orphans had been living she said but why should i now am i to be guilty of such a sin against my children the archimandrite too tried to persuade her he breathed into her ear you will make a new man of him she was horrified and people wondered at her how can you refuse such a piece of luck and this was how he overcame her in the end anyway he was a suicide he said and not a babe but a youth and owing to his years he could not have been admitted to the holy communion and so he must have been bound to give at least some account if you enter into matrimony with me i'll make you a solemn promise i'll build a church of god to the eternal memory of his soul she could not stand out against that and consented so they were married and all were in amazement they lived from the very first day in great and unfeigned harmony jealously guarding their marriage vow and like one soul in two bodies she conceived that winter and they began visiting the churches and fearing the wrath of god they stayed in three monasteries and consulted prophecy he built the promised church and also a hospital and almshouses in the town he founded an endowment for widows and orphans and he remembered all whom he had injured and desired to make them restitution he began to give away money without stint so that his wife and the archimandrite even had to restrain him for that is enough they said maxim ivanovitch listened to them i cheated foma of his wages that time said he so they paid that back to foma and foma was moved even to tears as it is i'm content says he you've given me so much without that it touched every one's heart in fact 
and it shows it's true what they say that a living man will be a good example and the people are good-hearted there his wife began to manage the factory herself and so well that she's remembered to this day he did not give up drinking but she looked after him at those times and began to nurse him his language became more decorous and even his voice changed he became merciful beyond all want even to animals if he saw from the window a peasant shamelessly beating his horse on the head he would send out at once and buy the horse at double its value and he received the gift of tears if any one talked to him he melted into tears when her time had come god answered their prayers at last and sent them a son and for the first time maxim ivanovitch became glad he gave alms freely and forgave many debts and invited the whole town to the christening and next day he was black as night his wife saw that something was wrong with him and held up to him the new-born babe the boy has forgiven us she said he has accepted our prayers and our tears for him and it must be said they had neither of them said one word on that subject for the whole year they had kept it from each other in their hearts and maxim ivanovitch looked at her black as night wait a bit said he consider for a whole year he has not come to me but last night he came in my dream i was struck to the heart with terror when i heard those strange words she said afterwards the boy had not come to him in his dream for nothing scarcely had maxim ivanovitch said this when something happened to the new-born babe it suddenly fell ill and the child was ill for eight days they prayed unceasingly and sent for doctors and sent for the very best doctor in moscow by train the doctor came and he flew into a rage i'm the foremost doctor said he all moscow is awaiting me he prescribed a drop and hurried away again he took eight hundred roubles and the baby died in the evening and what after that maxim ivanovitch settled all his property on his beloved wife gave up all his money and all his papers to her doing it all in due form according to law then he stood before her and bowed down to the earth let me go my priceless spouse save my soul while it is still possible if i spend the time without profit to my soul i shall not return i have been hard and cruel and laid heavy burdens upon men but i believe that for the woes and wanderings that lie before me god will not leave me without requital seeing that to leave all this is no little cross and no little woe and his wife heard him with many tears you are all i have now upon the earth and to whom am i left said she i have laid up affection in my heart for you this year and every one in the town counselled him against it and besought him and thought to hold him back by force but he would not listen to them and he went away in secret by night and was not seen again and the tale is that he perseveres in pilgrimage and in patience to this day and visits his dear wife once a year End of part three chapter three